this idea of intelligent design, my question to you, like right off the bat was, is this an idea that you, did you have a pre, did you have a notion in your mind already that you were trying to prove? Or was this something that you sort of started to believe upon the preponderance of evidence? It was more the latter, but I had a, by the time I first encountered it, a philosophical framework that made me open to it. Um, I had a long, protracted uh, religious conversion from late high school all the way through college. It, took, it was the last thing from a Damascus Road experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did it happen? It was a, a process of philosophical deliberation. It was not really based on science initially. I started having weird existential questions when I was 14 years old after I'd broken my leg in a skiing accident. And oh. questions like, well, what's it going to matter in 100 years? Uh, I, I was, there's this great quote from Bertrand Russell where he says, you know, that all the, the noonday genius of human achievement is destined for extinction in the vast heat death of the solar system. Hmm. Whoa. I had never encountered Bertrand Russell as a 14-year-old, but I later encountered <laughs> that quote, and I thought, that was what was bothering me, you know. That I, dude was a scorcher. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I read in the hospital after I had this accident, I was reading a, a book about the history of baseball, and I was totally into baseball at the time. I couldn't think of a, a, a better, a, a higher form of human achievement than to play for the New York Yankees. Mm. And yet all the stories of the great baseball guys ended the same. You know, they, they were recruited by uh, scouts who saw their talent. They came up to the big leagues. They uh, uh, amassed records. They won a certain number of World Series. And then, you know, if they were really great, uh, they go to the Hall of Fame and retire at 38. And then what? And then I got to thinking, well, but then what for any of us, you know? And and so I was I was this this question of of uh, of meaning kind of haunted me. What 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 could I possibly do that would have any lasting or enduring meaning? And um, I ended up taking I, I did a physics major and a geology major uh, in college, but I took as many philosophy classes as I could along the way, and I encountered these existentialist writers who were asking these same types of questions and realized, oh, uh, as a 14-year-old, I thought I must be insane to be having these questions. And I worried that I was insane. I was a real, I mean, it was a, it was a real funk I was in for six or eight months. Uh, and then later I realized, no, these were philosophical questions. And for me, uh, the religious conversion I had started to address and answer those questions. So I was, I was, by the time I got out of college, I was a convinced theist for philosophical reasons. But, it, but I had, at that point, I was completely comfortable with the evolutionary explanation of everything. And then at a conference in my, uh, that I attended uh, while I was working as a geophysicist, uh, it was a conference about the origin of the universe, the origin of life, and the origin and nature of human consciousness. Hmm. And it was divided on each panel between theists and philosophical materialists who were debating these, these big questions at the intersection of science and philosophy. And I was kind of stunned to learn, or to, to perceive at least, that the theists seemed to have the intellectual initiative in each of these big discussions, that materialism was a philosophy that was a spent force. It was not explaining where life first came from or the universe came from, let alone consciousness. And so I began in a sense, on a kind of intellectual journey to see where these new evidences, the evidence for the beginning of the universe or the fine-tuning of the universe, or the, the thing that really intrigued me was the discovery that at the foundation of life and even the very simplest cells, we have this amazingly complex code. The DNA, we all learn about it in high school. We think that you know, we all learn about the double helix structure of the DNA molecule, but that's not the most important thing about it. It's that within that double helix, there is literally a code, uh, a digital information that is directing the construction of the important proteins and protein machines that every, cells, every cell needs to stay alive. Bill Gates has said it's like a software program, but much more complex than any we've ever created. And I was doing, at the time, um, for the, the work as a geophysicist for an oil company, I was doing uh, uh, seismic digital signal processing, which was an early form of information technology. And I got fascinated with the idea that that there was this, first of all, an impasse in evolutionary explanations of the origin of life. Nobody how we got, knew how we got from the chemistry in the prebiotic soup to the code in an actual living cell. 
but it, it was fascinating that the, the impasse was created by the mystery surrounding the origin of information. Where did that come from? And so uh, a year later, I was off to, to uh, grad school in England. I ended up doing a PhD in origin of life biology within a uh, history and philosophy of science uh, department in, in Cambridge. And um, so that's kind of my a sketch of my journey and how I got interested in this. I saw in one of your previous interviews, you said that you were very interested in origin stories. And yeah. Me too. You know, that was the... Well, it's always interesting when you see someone who's kind of dedicated their life to a very specific thing. Like, where, what's the root of this? Where did it come from? So for you, you, you went through this funk, and did you find comfort in religion? Is, th is that what helped you? What? Did you find structure in it? I found answers to basic worldview questions that I thought were, as a 14-year-old, I thought nobody, you know, there must be something wrong with me. Nobody else is having these questions. I'm not talking to anyone at school who's worried about I think you're just smart. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I remember one day, I mean, just... Uh, Gotta love Joe. Re well, okay, for example, I was in this big leg cast, and I would crutch my way up to the, to the uh, uh, up our driveway, get the newspaper, bring back the box scores to read, you know, about the baseball games the night before. And every day, it's a new date. And I do this, and a new date, and a new date. And I started thinking, time is a really freaky thing. I can imagine an event, and you know, I'm going to lift this cup, I'm going to drop it, put it over there. Now, that event just took place, but it's already gone. We're not experiencing it anymore. We have a memory of it. But what does that actually mean? Where did, there was this flow of sensory experience but there didn't seem to be anything rooting it that gave it a, a, um, an enduring reality. Hmm. And I had this sense there must be something that doesn't change or else everything else that does change um, is passing, ephemeral, and, and ultimately of no account. And so, you know, you read, I, I ended up reading the big fat family Bible that I'd never cracked and uh, found that when God revealed his name to Moses, it was the I am that I am, this timeless, eternal person. Hmm. And you found the same thing in the New Testament, the way Jesus Christ was referred to. Was, uh, and so I thought, I, w I wonder if there is something that doesn't change. And so it, the kind of philosophical questions that I was having made me want to explore whether or not revealed religion might in fact be true. Number one, I gotta say, I do love Joe Rogan. I love that he's having on theist. I love that he's having on people that are able to have these deep conversations about God. And I have to say this, atheism globally only has 7% of the total population of the world that are atheists. Uh, it, in human history, it's actually less than that. It is extremely rare. There's this narrow sort of post-enlightenment time when we were obsessed with science as the only way of knowing. The only valid epistemology is if you can put it under a microscope, then you can know that it's true. Anything else doesn't count. And the problem with this is that you cannot scientifically prove things that we definitely know are realities, like love, for example, like thoughts, for example like morality, for example, that idea itself, that science is the only way to know, cannot actually be known scientifically. That itself is a, philo a philosophical claim. Science is simply the wrong instrument. So the fact that uh, the wrong modality, and so the fact that science has been used as something that is like discredited all their forms of knowing is, is the problem. But I love that you can see the needle starting to move. Even on a show as popular as Joe Rogan, you can see his openness and actually considering for the, for the first time how truly truly nonsensical it is to believe that all things and their intelligence and their beauty and their meaning and their complexity are arose from literally nothing at all with no intention with no design for no purpose from no intelligent mind just we suddenly have this vast matrix of information and meaning highly unlikely and you can see that light bulb starting to come on for rogan so if you're on the believer side of things Pray with me today for Joe Rogan. I do believe that God's working on him, and I think that we should pray together for him to see the, the beauty and the majesty of the God who made him. So let's do that today. Let's pray for Joe Rogan. And uh, all this being said, guys, thanks for watching the video if you're still watching it. I've been rambling for a while. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, all the things that tell YouTube that you guys like this content. I hope you did, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.